My name is Laurel Leff, and I am chair of the Holocaust Awareness Committee. And I'm, again, I'm glad to see you all here. Um, and we are going to listen to Max Michelson. Um, I learned uh, a bit about uh, Latvia and Jewry last semester um, during my American the Holocaust class. Uh, a student, Mackenzie Boyden, who I'm delighted to say is here today, along with another student from the class, Shelby Cole. And um, Mackenzie wrote an essay about the memorial book created by the Jews who had lived in Latvia to show, as the book put it, how much world Jewry and we ourselves lost by the annihilation of this community, which numbered almost 100,000 souls. Now, most Yisker books memorialize communities built around cities and towns where Jews were murdered. And in fact, my first encounter with Yisker books, and to some extent with the Holocaust itself, was as a child perusing my grandfather's Yisker book from Bialystok, the Polish city where he was born. A striking thing about the Latvian Yisker book, and therefore the diaspora community that prepared it, is that the horrible Nazi genocide project is seen as affecting not just the city of Riga or the many towns around it, but um, the entire Latvian nation. And our speaker today, Max Michelson, also sees himself as telling the Latvian story, and not just a story of Riga, the city where he was born and lived before he was sent to a concentration camp. It's a Latvian story because Latvia had a distinct history and Jewish community, and it's also a Latvian story because of the response of the non-Jewish Latvians to first the Soviet and the German, and then the German <coughs> occupation. Michelson tells both parts of the story in his affecting memoir, which is right here, um, that manages to be both erudite and emotional, universal and personal. Um, it's also available on Amazon in paperback, so um, that's also a good thing. Um, he tells of Jewish life before the war and the brief period of Jewish life in Latvia during the Nazi occupation. Brief, because most Jews were murdered in the Riga ghetto's liquidation in November 1941, just a few months after the German occupation. Most importantly, he tells the story of the 100,000 souls who perished, among them his parents and too many relatives and friends to name. As Mackenzie, my student, quoted the Latvian Yisker book, which was published in 1971, 25 years passed since we ceased to die, but it took a long time before we began to live. We are so glad and grateful that Max Michelson, as part of his life in America, had the courage to tell his story and the generosity to share it with us today. So, Max. And he just wants to be handed Max for you. Good afternoon. You'll excuse me, but I'll be sitting down. Bon appetit for those who haven't finished eating yet. Go right ahead. Eating, having almost starved to death is very important for me. Eat. Eat. Okay, dear friends, I'm here this morning to talk about the Holocaust and my own experiences during the war years. More than that, I've come to honor the dead and warn the living. On this occasion, I'm not your fellow American from Newton. I speak for, as one of the victims. It would be presumptuous for me to talk for all the six million, but I do think I may speak for the Latvian Jews and more specifically for the Riga Jewish community of which I was, my, my family and I were long time members. Riga, the capital of Latvia, had a thriving Jewish community of more than 45,000. More, about 25% of the, uh, I'm sorry, um, about 12% 12 of the Riga population. Most perished in the Holocaust. Less than 1,000 of them survived. I knew many of Riga's Jews, my relatives, my friends and acquaintances, my fellow inmates of the ghetto and the camps. I am one of them. My own survival is most implausible. 
more like a miracle. By all laws of probability, I too was killed in Riga. Having survived, I have the obligation to bear witness to the crimes and barbarous inhumanity perpetrated against us. And so I'm here today to speak for the victims. I am the vi voice of the vanished community of Riga. For us in Riga, the war started on June 22, 1941, when Germany attacked the Soviet Union. By July 1, Riga was overrun by the Nazis, but persecution started even before the arrival of the German army. Overnight, we became the prey. We were hunted in the streets and killed, dragged from our apartment, taken to police headquarters to be mocked, raped, tortured, and killed. Some of us were thrown into prison, a temporary way station to being killed. The voluntary police and local thugs took the lead in our persecution. After the war, it became clear that the killings were authorized and encouraged by the SS. At the time, it seemed all a local effort sparked by the anti-Semitic hatred and greed for our possession. And I should say, permission was given to kill and the population responded, not just the general population, but a lot of the um, members responded by killing enthusiastically. Once the, sort of the law is no, uh, goes out, the killings began, absolutely. I was 16 years old and had finished third year high school. Our family had recently moved to a suburb not known in the area, we were not touched during the first days of the occupation. I was anxious, restless, and never stayed home during the day. Some days later, upon returning home late one afternoon, I found my mother gone. She had been taken, supposedly to work. Being 11 years younger, she volunteered to go in my 60-year-old father's place, as he was not well at the time. I never saw my mother again. We heard that she was in prison together with some other Jewish women and was later, and was later killed. And had I been home that day, I too would have been taken and killed. Decrees of dehumanization and degradation controlled my life. I may not walk on the sidewalk. I may not ride the streetcars, I may not take taxis or the horse-drawn carriages, rental carriages in Riga. I may not go to the parks, to the theaters, to the museum. I must wear a yellow star on my breast. No, two yellow stars, one on my breast and one in the middle of the back. The yellow breast on the on the on the uh, the yellow star on the breast was too easy to hide. You you put the raincoat and walked like this. On the back had to be sewn on. It had to be sewn on everywhere. But my food rations were only half as large as those for the general population. And by the way, I couldn't use the general food stores. There were special food stores for Jews, and the food wasn't always delivered. Starvation, deliberate starvation of the Jewish population started right at the, with the beginning, and it got, only got worse. I must shave my head. I may walk in the city streets only with a Gentile escort. The Gentile escort could be a young girl, a young boy, an old woman. It didn't matter. It had to be a, a Gentile escort because, of course, Jews could not be trusted to find their ways alone in the street. Yeah, that's the way it was. And so on and so on. Within six weeks of the occupation, we were forced to, forced to abandon our possessions in our apartments. We were hoarded, herded into an overcrowded ghetto. Here, surrounded by barbed wire, we were guarded by armed SS troops, not German, by the way, Latvian SS troops, and who shot to kill if he so much dared approach the fence. Caged like rats, we were ready to be exterminated. On two successive weekends, November 30th, 
that was, I think, a Saturday, and December 7th, that was, that was the following Sunday, uh, not Sunday, a week later Sunday. The ghetto was emptied. We were told that we would be relocated to the unspecified work camp farther east. 30,000 of us, men, women, children, were marched six miles to a nearby forested area, Romboli. There, after being forced to strip, we were machine gunned and dumped into prepared mass graves. And I should say, the whole Nazi uh, higher echelons, the SS leaders and so, were there to watch. The killers, by the way, were uh, German SS troops. During the evacu uh, evacuation, many people were killed in the ghetto itself. Most of the dead were old people and young children who had been unable to keep up with the marching columns or who had been shot and who had, and who had been shot on the spot. And that first Sunday, shortly after the evacuation was over, I was grabbed to a burial detail on the old Jewish cemetery, which was in one corner of the ghetto. The dead were being brought to the cemetery and dumped on top of the old graves, while my group were digging a large grave in the frozen ground. I still, the most vivid memory of that uh, burial detail was the sight of a neatly dressed infant girl, certainly no older than six months, who was lying on top of one of the old graves. There was no blood, no obvious sign of injury. She looked just a broken, discarded doll. And that memory of the crime, of the, really the crime, at the time, you know, it was a reality and it didn't penetrate, but over the years, this stays with me that, that, that you know, from a human, uh, civilized point of view, such crime is unbelievable. And yet it was, and repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. It wasn't just a single crime. It was uh, 30,000 people, uh, actually 27,000 people at the time were murdered in Romboli over two weekends. And that crime was repeated and repeated. Four, five months after the Nazis entered Riga, our entire community had been wiped out. In fact, the uh, the destruction was so precipitous that we didn't know really what happened until we were dead. Only a small work camp of men remi remained the so-called little ghetto house by some 4,500 4, people, mostly men. There were about 500 women, just about 20 or 30 children who had somehow hidden or were somehow saved. From I should say that my own survival again was a chance. We had uh, my father. Had f my father had found a, uh, a apartment in the east in the eastern half of the ghetto. The western half was open. Uh, was empty the first weekend. So we went that weekend. I wasn't touched. By the second weekend, there had been a small work camp set up for men only, and by that time, um, I knew enough to drag my father uh, into the small work camp. My father were in the work camp. We had escaped the initial evacuation of the ghetto because by chance, our room was in the eastern half of the ghetto, not affected by the first weekend. That Sunday, after the evacuation uh, was over, we were able to cross into the so-called little ghetto, the work camp. My many husbands and fathers chose to remain with their families, while others fled to the relative sa temporary safety of the little ghetto. As my mother was no longer with us, leaving behind was not an issue. Unlike Jews in Western Europe, in Latvia we had no support from the general community. A few Jews were hidden by their Gentile friends and acquaintances, and even by uh, Latvians who were willing to help were denounced to the Gestapo by their neighbors. 
One exception was a case of a woman, Frieda Michelson, not a relative, who had mir miraculously managed to escape from the, uh, at the Lumbury massacre site. It, when she approached, uh, she hid under a pile of discarded shoes, and at night she was able to slip out. When she approached her former friends for help, Frida was repeatedly rebuffed and turned away. She was eventually sheltered and saved by a group of devout Seventh-day Adventists, some of which even didn't know that she was Jewish. Frida was one of two or three who actually survived the massacre site in Lombardy. A notable heroism in saving Jewish lives was shown by one Yanis Lipka. He did not turn away any Jew who came to his house seeking help. With his wife Johanna and two friends, Lipka managed to hide and save as many as 60 Jews. Unfortunately, righteous Gentiles were the exception to the general indifference and outright hostility we encountered among our non-Jewish neighbors. I should say also, the, we lived in an area of corruption. And while I knew of Janis Lipka, I'd heard about that, Jan's, and I knew even where he was. At the time, it never occurred to me that anybody would save a Jew without being paid for it. And I did not attempt to go to his place because I didn't have any money, nothing to save. The, the, listen, you let me talk, I'll talk all afternoon, so we have to go on. I'm sorry. Our living conditions had been poor in the large ghetto. Now the overcrowding got worse. Together with eight other men, we shared an apartment consisting of one small room and a tiny kitchen. You entered the kitchen and there was a room. It was a working class area and a working class building and there were eight such apartments, one room, a tiny kitchen room, and at night we put blank uh, mattresses all over the floor side by side. Still, what was to come, our circumstances were almost luxurious. We had our own mattress, we, had, we were on our own. In the concentration camps, three of us shared a single straw pallet. We could only dream of such extravagance as we had in this small ghetto. Here we were not subject to constant surveillance by, the, by our jailers and enjoyed the modicum of privacy even in the, in the crowded condition. Life in the little ghetto was a numbing routine. Day in, day out, cold, shine, rain, snow, street, sleet, we trudged back to work in the city and back to the ghetto, always in encountered because by a Gentile, because after all, we could, didn't know where we were going. And by the way, I have some pictures of that. Uh, rather than showing in between, I'll collect and uh, we'll show them all at the end. Um, our jobs included janitorial work, maintenance tasks. We moved the looted furniture in from into apartments being prepared for our German occupiers. The few surviving Jewish women, our mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters, became cleaning women. Jewish artisans worked at their various crafts, tailors, shoemakers, glove makers, etc. Good jobs were indoors, especially if food could be found nearby or clothing or boots could be stolen and traded for food later on. The taking anything back into the ghetto, however, was hazardous. The ghetto guards would check the returning columns periodically, and anyone who was uh, caught with food or any other item that they con uh, considered uh, contraband would be killed on the spot. Um, <coughs> there was a one sort of anecdote, and that was there a woman. A, later on, we had some German women living in, in the in the get part of the ghetto. And she, a German soldier on her work job had given her a sandwich for her children. She was caught at the, at the um, gate and executed in front of her children. 
My father became depressed. He must have realized that my mother was dead at the time. Actually, she wasn't dead, but she was killed a little later. But he, we never talked about it. Unable to face the daily track, trek into town, he found work inside the ghetto. On Bloody Tuesday, that was the day after the evacuation of the second half of the ghetto, the, the Latvian SS units combed the, the now empty ghetto for hideouts for people who was uh, uh, not searching for people who were hiding, and, and those found were shot on the spot or again taken to a nearby Bicker Neko forest, which is in a slightly different area than the Rumbuli forest, but in the same general direction, and, uh, and killed there. And the little ghetto was empty that day, and everybody who stayed in the ghetto that day was also taken away to Bicker Neko and killed there. The uh, when I returned that evening, uh, the, for, uh, the ghetto was empty, and my father did, was not in our room as he had been on previous days. And he did not come back that e in the evening, nor on any of the follow that follows. And slowly I began to understand what had happened. I did not grieve. I was numb. I had seen people killed. I had buried many of the killed in the large ghetto during the burials that there were. It was obvious what lay in store, in store for all of us. My parents had disappeared. Nobody saw or reported them killed. There was no burial. There was no closure. At first, I didn't even admit to myself that they had been killed. Slowly, the overwhelming evidence of the wholesale murders convinced me that they too were dead. But only years later, after liberation, did I say Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead for them. The daily routine of the little ghetto was frequently interrupted by beatings, searches, selections, and killings. Jews were outside the law. The penalty for any offense, real or imagined, was death. Death remained a constant presence throughout my years in the camps. It hovered over us, striking capriciously out of the blue. The possession of a loaf of bread, a banknote, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, having the wrong facial expression, anything at all became a pretext for killing us. In fact, no reason was even needed. A step out of line pro could provoke a murderous attack. I tried to avoid being noticed, avoid eye contact, tried to make myself invisible. At work, I worked purposely, carrying some tool, a hammer, a screwdriver, a wrench, just to give the impression that I was on some legitimate uh, uh, errand. Two years later, after the little ghetto was also closed, we were transferred to Kaiserwald, the concentration camp built in Riga in 1943. Now we lost our names, and became numbers. Then, in 1944, as Riga was about to fall to the advancing Russian army, Red Army, we were taken to Stutthof, a large concentration camp near Gdansk in what is now Poland. Under, unlike Auschwitz, Stutthof did not have large-scale um, gas chambers or crematoria. Nonetheless, the, the death toll for malnutrition and disease was staggering. Concentration camps were notorious for the pervasive violence and brutality. The starvation diet, the cramped barracks, the narrow bunks that made sleeping a nightmare, the interminable roll calls, mornings and evenings, were deliberate made to result in maximum harassment and discomfort. And all that, by the way, was a minimum of food. You got the watery, uh, you got dark water, which they called soup, with a rotten piece of cabbage, if you were lucky, and a, a quarter of a loaf of bread. 
standing at attention at, uh, for hours and hours. We were counted, recounted, and counted again, and the count was never matched, and they kept counting and counting. It's terrible. The, everything was intended to make our existence unendurable. The Nazis encouraged brutality, rewarding the most violent among our, the criminal inmates. This promotion to couple had head man sort of a group of prisoners or other camp perks. It would be hard to imagine a more cruel and sadistic bunch of misfits. In Stutthof, luck was again with me. After just four weeks in that hell, 500 of us, part of the remnant of the Jewish community, were sent to a small to a small slave, a slave labor camp in Magdeburg, which was part of the Buchenwald satellite system. We worked in an ammunition factory 12 hours a day, alternating weekly between day shift and light shift, and kept on a starvation diet. The Nazis were determined to work us to death. And again, I was just maybe a month or so away from the end when we were liberated eventually. I worked side by side with a German master. And after, after a month of being together for the long 12-hour shifts, day or night, we did not develop any personal relationship. When I made a mistake, he became irritated, but unlike some of the other masters, he never hit me. On the other hand, beyond instructing me about my assignment, he never spoke with me. He did not ask anything about me. He had nothing to say to me. I found my master's attitude strange and disturbing, and I resented being tra treated as a non-person. In fact, I was a number. I was not a name. I was not a person. You lose your name, you, you're no longer it, the same. The, um, during lunch, while I received my usual clouded, dirty waters called soup, he unwrapped a very neatly packed small sandwich and ate it without ever throwing me a, f a crown. I didn't, uh, he didn't wear a Nazi insignia. He may not even be a Nazi party member. As far as I was concerned, he was not human, just an out and out Nazi bastard. In the spring of 1945, as the war was drawing to a close, the factory stopped working and we all, Germans and Jews alike, awaited for the end of the war. One day we awoke to find our guards gone and the door gate open. Together with three friends, as some others did, but we were, I was in a group of four with three friends, we immediately ran out of the camp, went into downtown Magdeburg, which is all bombed out, and climbed over a, a pile of debris and into a segment in the basement of a bombed out building, and uh, wait, and, and, uh, and so we escaped. And there were more adventures. We were caught again. But anyway, we ended up sitting for four weeks in the no man's land. The Americans came to the river. We had been sent over to hide on, to, not to hide, to report on the other side, but hid anyway because the, the guard didn't go with us. And we sat in the garage of a private house for four weeks waiting until the Russians, the Red Army, came after finishing Berlin. And I was liberated on the day after the VE Day on May 9th, 1945. It totally emaciated and very sick. I spent three months in Soviet hospitals to regain my strength. And after escaping to Berlin, I ended up in the American zone of occupation. By the way, I escaped. I was liberated by the Soviets. I spent three months in various Soviet hospitals. And when it came to being repatriated to Riga, I escaped from the Soviets to Berlin and, and so on, ended up in the in the, uh, yeah, I had no love lost for the Soviets either. We knew what the, the after, so I, I ended up in the American zone of uh, uh, as occupation. I was able to contact my uncle in New York, who brought me to New York City in January 1947. 
And in this blessed country, I was able to start a new life, m finish my education, marry and raise a family. That is a short version of my history. Thank you. Well, the talking about the question is, what personal quality did I possess to, serve, to uh, actually talk about it and so on? The talking about, I find that uh, my survival didn't make any sense in any realistic uh, way. And I, have, I feel that I have the obligation, you can get it started if you want. Uh, uh, you, uh, I have the obligation to tell the story. This makes some sense for my survival. At least I survived for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. The otherwise, I don't know, you face, when, for me at least, in the camps, there was a reality. This is a reality, and you have to deal with it. You can't, uh, you can, uh, 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 what do you call it? complain, you can, can uh, argue about it. There's nothing to argue about. The, the reality is that they try to kill you, and you try to, survive. Any other questions? No, then, oh, yes. Were you able to reconnect after the war with anyone from the Keep family? Keep Were you able to reconnect after the war with anyone from the uh, Was I able to reconnect after the war? The answer was yes, to the extent that there were people alive to reconnect with. I con reconnected quite easily. That was it was really not a problem. The, uh, what I really in thinking about it is, it, it, at the time, it was uh, interesting that um, I, um, when you lose your name, you become a non-entity. And even though at work in the, Germ in the uh, German satellite camp, uh, one of my friends who worked as an electrician sabotaged the elevator. He crossed wires, the elevator went, nothing big, but they couldn't raise the, uh, from first to second floor, so the freight elevator. Our camp leader, the Jewish camp leader, gave him a new number. And you wouldn't believe it, they couldn't find him. They didn't. He was not the same number. Obviously, he was not the same person. It's incredible, incredible. Okay, uh, just a few pictures to illustrate the talk. Um, Riga is here. Latvia, the three Baltic countries. From Riga, concentration camp. Uh, in fact, my parents came from the western part of Courland, which was a uh, Courland, which was a German. Uh, occupied, uh, not German occupied, it was a German uh, colonized in the 13th century and had a strong German influence. Uh, my family spoke German in, uh, here in Latvia. My mother came from Vilnius, she was born in Vilnius, lived in Daugavpils, and it was an arranged marriage. With, and, uh, anyway, and then when we were evacuated for Riga, we were evacuated by ship, which was another nightmare to Gdansk, and then later on to Magdeburg, where the, the camp was. In the next one. Can you? Oh, th that's just the timing. Let's keep going. One more. Oh, these are my parents. Uh, in 1939 or something like that, 38, 39, and that's my family in 1930, that's me, uh, I had my sister died in 1934 of meningitis, uh, that's my grandmother who, who was a matriarch of that family, this is the, uh, the Michelson side of the family, that had my mother, my father, my uncle Arthur, a Ger a German, he was married to my aunt Thea, and uh, she's my aunt, he was m her husband's married, and uh, my cousin. He uh, was a, br they were by chance, he had been born in Melbourne in Australia and was able to get British citizenship and spent the war years in 
in, anyway, there's too much of a story. My uncle, he was murdered in Riga. My aunt, uh, Clara, she was murdered. She was a Latvian citizen living in Paris and was murdered by in, in, uh, at Auschwitz. Interestingly now, uh, she happened to be in Paris also under the German occupation. British citizen, they didn't touch her. She spent the war years as a housekeeper. Uh, she, a uh, writer, Latvian citizen, got murdered, deported to. Anyway, <laughs> let's go on. Well, that's the Riga uh, synagogue, the Gogol synagogue in Riga before the war. In uh, uh, July 5th, 1941, a, a, a uh, armed, uh, not armed, um, University students from a fraternity, Letonia, which is a particularly anti-Semitic fraternity, arrived here. Um, they were refugees from Lithuania, was at the time in the thing. They, b they locked them in, uh, gasoline on the door, and burned the thing down. Next. That's what it looks like today. I, uh, I actually, I took this picture in 1995, uh, and I visited. After that, we became independent. Next picture. Uh, that's a ghetto. Uh, the we lived in the eastern part of the ghetto. This is where our apartment was, and then they had the work camp. Uh, the little work camp was in this area, and we. Uh, I dragged my father from here into. At that time, my father really was already quite depressed, and, and uh, but I had uh, this. Uh, as I said, I had the sense that the uh, camp, uh, the um, uh, work camp. <coughs> had at the moment at least a better sense of survival and managed to, to be there. Next thing. Uh, this is a picture of the Riga ghetto taken. These were from the outside, from the Gentile side, with a sign that in Latvian and in German that anyone approaches a fence from either side will be killed, will be shot. Uh, and this is a picture of one of the houses they got after the evacuation. The evacuation, uh, the evacuation to the murder site was so precipitous that when the German Jews who were later brought in um, to uh, live in parts of the ghetto found unf unfinished food on the plates on the table. Next. This is another view. The, at the time, this is already when the Germans were on one side, this was the German Reich, uh, Jewish ghetto and the Latvian side was here for just a men's ghetto, and there was a main street. Let's go ahead. Oh, this is interesting. This is a working co work column of Jewish workers in Riga, and uh, there's a German soldier with a bike who's the escort to tell him where to go, and that was uh, coming either to or from work. On the go ahead. And that's what this same place, uh, no, that's what the ghetto looks like today. Except for the barbed wire fence, there's very little difference. The, there are few new buildings, but most of them. The, uh, back here, you can see this was a typical build, the typical buildings of the ghetto area, a very impoverished area of Riga. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a better view of these. Uh, this is what the ghetto looks like. One more. Oh. And this is a building where we lived in the ghetto. There were four apartments. This is the, the main room here, the kitchen, the do a doorway, and another kitchen, another main room. Four on each floor, eight apartments altogether. We lived in, I think we lived in, no, we lived in the back. This is from the street side. Go ahead. Um, this is the uh, site of the Rumboli as it appeared in uh, 1997. At the time, under the Soviets, it was not admissible that the Jews were killed. The fascist uh, victims, it said in uh, uh, Latvian, uh, uh, Russian, and Yiddish, the f fascists for the fascist vict victims, they didn't admit that they were Jews. This was uh, sort of the wrong thing to say under the uh, Soviets. Go ahead. And uh, these are the mass graves that were there. Go ahead. And then in 202, Germany paid for a rather elaborate 
uh, monuments with this more of descriptions and so on, uh, and menorah and so on. Go ahead. That's it. Okay, more questions. Yes. How did you feel when you returned to Riga for the first time after the war? It was 1995? Question is, how did I feel after I visited Riga? I visited Riga in 1993, the first time after uh, the uh, Latvia became independent again. I have to tell you, first of all, I was not about to visit Riga under the Soviets. Uh, having been a Soviet citizen before that, I didn't take any chances. But in Riga, uh, Riga was, a, for me at the time, was a very familiar place. Very little had changed. There were a few new buildings. There were new outsk outskirts built. But the center of Riga was what I remembered before. Even the doors had not been painted. Um, the only problem was the people weren't there. It was uh, uh, rather, uh, I, I wasn't comfortable in Riga. I visited two more times. Once with, m the first time, I, I went three times altogether. Once, once with my wife, to sort of introduce her to the background, and then with each of my sons. And uh, they weren't bad visits, but uh, I was quite uncomfortable. You know, you go through the streets, oh, so my cousin lived here, and my uncle lived there, and this uh, kind of thing. Nobody was there. Uh, there were actually, there were a few, two, three people that I knew, but uh, most of the people who were there at the time were people who had escaped to the Soviet Union. Any more questions? Yes. Muslim, anti-refugee, anti-immigrant sentiments, and especially in Europe and the United States, I just be curious on your opinion of, of that. Yeah, it, as far as I'm concerned, déjà vu. Mm -hmm. It's more of the same. During the, uh, during the Holocaust, they didn't want the Jews here. Now there is another catastrophe going on. They want, don't want the Muslims here. It's unconscionable. I think I read somewhere that the U.S. had admitted 2,500, some such number, 2,000 plus mm, Syrian refugees. I think it's a disgrace. The fact, yes, we have to carefully vet the people that we don't want to admit terrorists because there are terrorists among them, but the great majority are just trying to uh, save their lives. And as such, it's a... Uh, yeah, well, uh, let me not go there, <laughs> because, uh, because then I'll get into the, the, uh, the uh, refugee, the whole immigration policy here is broken, and it is terribly broken, and I hope something will, will be done at some point. The, uh, you know, the family, four children are Americans, uh, these are Brazilians. Four children are American citizens, and the parents live in, day in, in fear of being deported. And the man works, she works. I mean, it, it, they're not terrorists, they're nothing. It's just, it's just, but you know, the history of the U.S. has been that way all, uh, all along, not just before, from before the Holocaust, too. We are here, now let's close the gates. talk about how you understood and understand now the enthusiasm of your Latvian neighbors for murdering uh, Jews. What uh, was the context? The question is, them? what was, it, how do I understand the enthusiasm of Latvian neighbors for killing? Well, what, uh, was the, what was the prehistory that made the, them? The immediate history for the, for was, and, uh, we were occupied by the Soviets for a year. And uh, among Jewish socialists and communist circles, that uh, the Soviets were welcomed. Not, not by the bourgeois Jews who, who just lost all the what they had, but by the, uh, and the myth perpetrated by the Nazis and by the Latvian collaborators was the Soviets were all Jews and they took it out on the Latvians. The, the head of the uh, NKVD, the Russian KGB at the time, was in fact a Jew, 
but uh, so were a lot of Latvians. The, in the, uh, Lat the Latvian communists have themselves a very long history of being Lenin, was working for Lenin and so on. Yeah, but the myth perpetrated was that all the Jews were guilty, and now we can take revenge. And the fact is basically, in any society, when the uh, sort of the civilized veneer comes off, you can do whatever you want without the thing, they do. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Oh. The question is, has Latvia acknowledged, or the Latvians have acknowledged their role during the Holocaust? The answer is basically no. Uh, I have to tell you, Germany is essentially the only country in Europe that has uh, made uh, acknowledged, made peace with themselves, so to say. This is what we did. It was terrible, and we uh, we try. There, uh, Latvia is not. They, they celebrate uh, the Latvian Legionnaire Days. Uh, they they sort of uh, ha quasi uh, comment, but it's it's, it's not. They they have not. And they're no different. France, France was terrible, the Vichy government. The Vichy government, interestingly enough, was fighting, they were still fighting the Dreyfus affair. The army felt humiliated, and now they could take revenge. That was the Vichy, Ju Jewish policy in Vichy. The difference somewhat was that uh, they were more righteous Gentiles, or people who helped in France and in Latvia. Latvia, you can count them on one hand. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit, Max, about your process of deciding that you wanted to speak about this and write about about your experiences? You know, when did that happen? And um, was there a precipitating uh, the, event? Uh, uh, well, when I came out of the Holocaust, I had almost blinders on. Uh, make, uh, get an education. Uh, for five years, I did manual labor, and manual labor is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but ex except as a life's vocation, it was not my choice. So get an education, and secondly, start a family and build a family. Within a year, within the six months, I was in college when I got to U.S. Within a year and a half, I was married, and. Uh, uh, they, we went from there. It took about 30, 25, <coughs> 30, 35 years before I really sort of had established myself and so And that time I decided it's time to start speaking. I was very, very nervous. I spoke at the local synagogue. I dragged my wife along for support and so Anyway, but uh, so having started, I don't refuse anyone who wants me to talk. I don't go sort of selling, pushing it, but anyone. And I have to tell you, I've spoken in big groups, small groups, inter interviews about 400 times over the years. Then as I made notes for speaking, the notes got more and more elaborate, and eventually adding the family history became my book. Uh, it's, it just went. Uh, it just grew, so to say. It was not a, a, a one decision, now I'll talk. It, it's, it grew. I, a part of it was the uh, Six-Day War in Israel. At the time, it was a very anxious time. It was always a worry of a repeat of the Holocaust. And that gave me the sort of a push to participate more in the Jewish community. Uh, we were quite active. My wife and I were very active in the framing of Jewish community and so on. Uh, but uh, with, uh, with also, uh, if always anyone was asked to talk, I'm here. Uh, yes? Uh, when you moved to America, did you meet many other Holocaust survivors? Uh, did I meet many other Holocaust survivors when I was in, came to America? Basically, not really. 
most of the uh, part of it was there was a very limited number of survivors from Riga who I kept in touch with, maybe a handful, ten or so, something like that. Most of the survivors were from Poland. And I did not be, uh, I now know more people in the various organizations that I participate, but at the time I did not, and I didn't uh, go searching them out really. Uh, uh, as I say, I was busily working my family, that was it. What kind of welcome did you get from Americans when you came here outside of What kind of welcome? Interesting, uh, did I get from Americans when I came to New York City? Oh. This is very interesting. Someday you must talk to me about it. <laughs> Someday. It, in, in fact, uh, I had a friend at the time who, uh, when I, we were together at this party or someday, I said, when would you want me to come? And I got a kick from my friends. That, that was not an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, th I think it worked both ways. <laughs> Uh, for us, uh, for the survivors, this was still too raw to talk about. And for the, uh, for the, uh, 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 the general population of the people, they didn't want to hear it. It took, uh, for me, but I say 25, 30 years before I really started to talk. Uh, the question is, how did I survive? Did I have a, a spiritual experience? Uh, I had a tremendous amount of hope. Uh, I was sure that if I survived, a decent life was waiting for me. That, that was clear. The question whether I did or didn't survive was not the question. I, I, di I di didn't know. Basically, for me, it is you live one day at a time. You get up in the morning, you see, try to avoid getting killed that day or whatever, uh, and just keep on going that way. You d there's an immediacy, an immediacy a reality that you have to deal with. Where do I hide? Where do I go? Where is the, and the answers are by no means clear. Is this better here or better there? Well, they're both traps, and which trap is better, who knows? So it, 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 from my point of view, it's a total preoccupation with trying to survive the moment. And there's no time for, f f for metaphysical uh, thoughts or, or things. I, well, the part of it I do have to say, I do not have faith that God will interfere or anything. As far as I'm concerned, God wasn't there. I, I don't ask why or where he was or why he wasn't there. The fact is, he wasn't there. And if he w had been there and had been involved, I would say, that God I don't like. But for me, at least, the, I can excuse him. He was absent for whatever reason. He was absent. Yes? Do I have general observations of uh, humanity? I, you know, when we came out, we said never again. And the fact is that's not true. The, it happens all over uh, Rwanda. You know, uh, I really must say I don't have much faith in humanity. If the police is there at the corner, it's, it works. But the the moment they turn away and say you can do what you want, it's, it falls apart. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I just had a question about the days leading up to. Um, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, sorry. Um, so the days leading up to when you um, were exiting the camp and the guards left and the, the escort was in, were you aware of 
what was happening to the Muslims? Did you know that it was coming? The question I think you very worded is was I aware what was happening during the war in the world? Yeah. In general, yes. When we in Riga, in the get when we were in the ghetto and working in the city, we had some access to radios, and the BBC was uh, a good source that we tried to hear and so on. Um, in the camps, uh, the access was limited, but you can sort of see the German, when the Germans had victories every time retreating in Russia, we knew the geography. After Stalingrad, we knew the thing was over. The war was over, Germany had lost. Ge maybe nobody else knew. We knew this was clear. Uh, whether we would survive or not, that was another question. That you clearly didn't know. You tried, you hope. But we kind of knew, we knew the invasion, we knew every, basically all, not all the details, but we knew basically what was going on. Okay, good. All right, one more, and, and then we have to conclude. Um, did you ever have a positive interaction with the Nazi soldier? A positive interaction with the Nazi soldier? I don't know. There were, um, first of all, I should say, not with an, if at all, with a German soldier, separate. It wasn't, not all the Germans were Nazis, even though at the time that was the, our point of view, but the, the fact is that they were not all Nazis. Um, there were a few interactions here that they became discussions. Uh, we knew, oh, so and so, it was the, uh, the, uh, it was something nice to talk about. The, I have to say that from the German point of view, there was always some ideologue in the unit. And God forbid any of the soldiers should be nice to, uh, to a Jew. They immediately would be shipped into the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front, Russia, uh, was, the, uh, was the really the uh, the Beth Noir, this is where they sent everyone, that was a hell, and they all knew it. And to some extent, even the Nazi killers did so because that kept, uh, that was a job that kept them from the going to the Eastern Front. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Thank you.